I'm just going to hydrate myself. How you feeling? Good. I was one of those guys who was kind of married to the job. I would make most every run that, uh, well, I don't want to say every run, but every fire run that would come in. Deputy Fire Chief Glenn Phillips believes the fire started in the back of the home. And we had a lot of confined spaces, and that's a problem for us because you, you get hit in fires. Anything, anything that happened in our county, I was there. I was Johnny on the spot. which was fun. It's, it's like excitement that you just can't imagine. Uh, it didn't matter if it was two o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock at night, uh, you know, when the run came in, I'd go. Well, that abruptly, and I mean abruptly, stopped in 2014. My involvement now is 90% administrative, and I don't make many runs at all anymore. I, I remember it vividly. I was down over the hill right down here in the front yard on the tractor. I turn around to back the tractor up, and I'm looking at the mower, and I see two mowers. And I'm going, what the hey? Doctors, they don't know what it is. I started researching on my own. I wrote this, I used it like a three or four page letter to my neurologist and I handed it to him while I walked in and um, he read it. He says, well, you probably don't have my senior gravis, but uh, we'll, we'll check you out. And, and uh, that's what it was. My senior grab is. Get this out of the way here and try this again. Okay. So how'd you tolerate your last infusion? That was great. Okay. And you're, how are you feeling today? I feel, uh, I feel weak. I can tell. Well. I think you're to the right of it. You think I am? Mm-hmm. Regular, healthy people operate at 100%. Hi, Mr. A person with myasthenia gravis on a good day operates at 70% on a good day. You think about on your bad days, you can get 10% out of your battery. <clears throat> and that's it. And that's your life. And it sucks.
I don't care how long you have been in the fire service. Every time you're barreling down the road, it's the most awesome adrenaline raising thing that you can possibly imagine. It never gets old. It never, ever gets old. Ever. Ever. Do you miss it? Yes. What do you miss most about it? Being there with the guys. I just, I can't go with them anymore. You guys wanted everything. This is this is one of the bad times. It's um, twenty to one in the morning. It's the third time I've been up. I get uh, cramps and I get these things and they just won't go away. They're so painful. This will go on for another hour or two, if I'm lucky, before it stops. Over the last year or so, you know, I said, I've got to do something to, to keep my spirits up. And one day, one day, I was, I remember being on Facebook and, and there was an ad, something about the stock market. And I said, you know, I've always, you know, kind of wondered about what that is. It was like a moment of epiphany for me. I said, if I can read an EKG, if I can read a 12 lead and find out if somebody's having a trifascicular heart block. 665, 400. Darn it, I can read a financial chart. And that is gonna be $400 a share. And I said, it may take me a year to understand this thing, but by golly, it's a, it's a chart. It's an indicator of what's going on in a living, breathing thing. And the market is a living, breathing thing. So it is not at all about the money. Um, it's like riding a roller coaster. There is some adrenaline to it. And it was exciting. The stock market is a, you know, it's a fun thing, but yeah, it's not the same thing.
leaving the fire service is of you know, it's just it's just such a foreign thing to me. But you butt that up against the knowledge that oh, man, I just I can't keep doing this. And you talk about a, a mental battle going on in my head. How you know? How do you resolve this? And I haven't resolved it. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know the answer to that. Very few people know just just how bad it is unless you've unless you've kind of been through something like both of us have and he knows that you know you you try you do your very best and you you try and um, he understands as as do a lot of other people but Howard really understands What do you miss about the, the good old days? I remember, you know, seeing a house on fire, and we were probably more than 10 feet away from each other and couldn't see each other. Oh, I remember <laughs> couldn't see. Good, good couldn't see, see, see at all. Good to see uh, a thing. At all. <laughs> you don't feel like a real fireman anymore, do you? No, it's not, no. It's not running up there and, and grabbing that hose on your shoulder and knocking down that fire inside of a room of a house. And, and I, I miss that a whole lot. Yeah, uh, I do too. I remember back in 2014, you were just sort of coming through your bout with cancer. And here I was, rapid emergence of symptoms I had. I had, I had one working eye, my muscles were gone. You remember that? Yes, I could, couldn't yes. speak, I couldn't speak. I, I, my voice wouldn't work. I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. I check on you a lot. You don't realize I check on you. I, Charlotte talked to Virginia. I talked to your neighbor because hmm. I do want to keep up with what's going on. If, if there's something going on that I think that would interfere with your health, I would say, Glenn, you can't go today. Yeah. You've questioned me before. Yeah, I, I don't you want, have, to, I don't want yeah. you to do that. But uh, you don't know how much I worried, how much I prayed and even cried you know, because of the, what I thought you were going through. And I thought, well, Glenn's not going to be with me. He, I, I know I'm going to lose him. I wasn't worried so much about firefighting. I, I just said, well, firefighting, we can put on the back shelf. I just want you to be here. I want you to be alive. I want you to be a part of us. Matter of fact, I, 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 can't, I can't think of a situation where you wouldn't be around, and I don't want that to ever happen. Uh, by rights, I should be the one to go first, not you, and, uh, you know, because I've lived a whole lot more of a life than you have. You've got life yet to live. And you know, this is today. What happened yesterday is gone. What happens tomorrow, we just don't know. Sun is 
creeping through Just dancing in the light Just dancing in the light Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2021 Rare Disease Week documentary screening panel discussion. Thank you to our friends at Argenex for sponsoring this event. My name is Brenda Colmenares, and I am the communications manager at the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. I feel very honored to be here with our amazing panelists to discuss this year's documentary selection, A Mystery to Me, which is a three-part series of documentary shorts and the first documentary about rare disease myasthenia gravis. As someone who was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis three years ago, hearing Glenn Phillips' story during the documentary really meant a lot. It always amazes me how impactful it can be to hear a story similar to your own and to hear what you are feeling through the lens of another person's experience. So to start things off, I would like to introduce our panelists and give them a few moments to share a little bit about themselves. So first, I'd like to welcome Ben Strang, the director of A Mystery to Me. Thank you so much, Ben, for being here. Absolutely, thanks for having me. So Ben, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and your experience with the film? Yeah, um, I'm originally from Maryland. Um, I've been directing films for uh, quite a while now. Um, a, lot, a lot of documentaries is, is mainly my background and I've been working on this project for about two years actually, um, from the time that we started uh, the kind of the research component of the film until uh, we, we released them last fall, it was about, uh, about two years. And um, I met Glenn about halfway through that. Uh, one of the highlights of those, of those two years and here we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. And next, I'd like to introduce Glenn Phillips, whose story was featured in this documentary. Thank you so much for being here with us, Glenn. And also, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Um, my name is Glenn. Uh, I'm 57 years old, and I was diagnosed with myasthenia in 2014. So it's about seven years ago. Um, uh, I've been in the fire service for 38 years. Um, I'm deputy chief of our local fire department here in Mercer County, and I've been a paramedic for 35 years. I teach. I like to teach. It was one of the, my favorite things to do prior to this. It's impacted uh, me to a degree, but um, that's me. I totally understand, Glenn. Thanks for sharing. So now I have a few questions from some members of the rare disease community for both of you that were sent to us after viewing Glenn's short film. So Glenn, let's go ahead and start things off with a question for you. Here it says that you talk about finding your diagnosis on the internet, which is very impressive. The internet can be overwhelming when looking up health information, specifically without a proper diagnosis. Could you share your experience while searching for information about your symptoms? And do you have any advice for those who might be in the same position? Yes, 
Absolutely. When, when my symptoms first started to emerge and they emerged rapidly, which I guess is a little different than a lot of folks with myasthenia, which they, some folks have told me that they tend to develop over a period of months or even years mm -hmm. and they have difficulty to get in diagnosis. Well, 2014, beginning part of May, um, all of a sudden I developed double vision and that escalated very quickly. Um, within a period of two, three, four weeks, I had lost my ability to, to speak, to form words. I'd lost a bunch of my mo mobility, um, worst neck pain I've ever had in my life. And I didn't understand what was going on. So uh, I had a little bit of an advantage in that I'd had a lot of medical classes prior to. Now this was at the paramedic level, you know, and I'm, I'm nowhere near being a doctor, but I had a little bit of help in knowing what some of the terminology was. The, the internet can be daunting by itself. Um, but my advice is if you're looking for something and you can't get in to see the doctor as quick as you'd like, uh, data points. Data points is, is the most important thing. You have to know what you're, you know, what, you're, what your body's doing. So if you have something new, something new develops, you need to write that down, make a diary, keep a diary, write down everything that's developing. And that helped me because when I went to a, approach eventually my neurologist, I was able to give him a, a four page written letter. This is what I'm pretty sure I have. These are my symptoms. This is how it escalated and it worked. I, the biggest help, the biggest help for me was, um, it was a program called Isabel. And um, Isabel, it's a, it's a paid program, but uh, Unlike typing in your symptoms in Google, um, it's medically formatted so that if you know the terminology, you can you can enter that data and it'll list to you from from a level, of, say, 100 percent down to 50 percent what the likelihood is of uh, your symptoms being a specific disease. It nailed it. It nailed it. And um, I, I can't sing its praises enough, but data points, um, being able to communicate with your with your physicians, and um, uh, keeping a good diary will go a long way in helping you out. Yeah, my first symptom actually was double vision as well. And I found out what I had basically thanks to Facebook groups. So thanks. If, I mean, I know what you mean. Um, thanks, Glenn. So next question is for Ben. Uh, this is the first documentary about myasthenia gravis. Could you share a little bit about how you first learn about this rare disease? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there was a uh, there was a a vision at Swarovski um, and with Argenix, um, who sponsored the film, to make a series of documentaries about sort of the life of uh, people with with myasthenia gravis and to tell their story in in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, and Swarovski brought, brought me on board to, to do that at a really early stage, actually. Um, they were still doing a lot of research and trying to understand um, various perspectives on MG. And what I came on basically at the beginning when we were really just having conversations with people, um, speaking with different um, people with MG all around the country um, and, and really just anecdotally um, getting an understanding of what MG is. Yeah. And so, you know, for the first year that I was working on the project, we were just meeting people essentially and just learning. Wow. Well, thanks for making this. It's great. Um, next question is for Glenn. You've mentioned that myasthenia gravis has taught you a lot about what people go through. Could you share some examples of what you meant by that? Yes. Yes, I can. Um, and, and I, I came at this, especially from a, a venue of having taught medical classes for a long time. And I've seen the list of neurological disorders, but they were a list to me. They were absolutely just a list. When I started having symptoms and it, and again, it escalated very quickly. And when I finally got my diagnosis, it was a, it was a tough time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it uh, obviously it's a very life, life changing event. Yeah. So, when, when I think about what, what that's done for me, it's, I, I thought, I thought I was having a stroke. I did. I thought I was having a stroke. And after, after eliminated certain things, I thought, 
this is a brain tumor. So I think everybody goes through that whole gamut of, oh, this is, you know, until you start, until you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But, but right now, I think I can, I can say that I have a whole lot more empathy for people who've had a, a, a stroke or a cerebral vascular accident. I have a whole lot more empathy when, when I'm taking care of somebody in the back of an ambulance or, or at a rec scene for those folks who've had autoimmune disorders, the, the silent, those silent diseases that people look perfectly fine on the outside, but you know, it's, it's those devastating internal signs and symptoms that are just, just awful. So when, when this thing happened to me, it, it, I had to reflect, I'd reflect a lot. I'm sure like a lot of healthcare professionals do if, you know, if they're faced with something like this, like how did I treat people before? Was I paying attention to them when they were, you know, when I was trying to have a conversation with them, when they were in the room, did I talk over top of them? Um, and that happens a lot, especially with stroke patients. You know, you may be talking to, to other members of the family and excluding the patient. And um, um, I dealt with that. I, I, not, not people weren't being intentionally mean, but it just, it's just, they react. And, and uh, it taught me never to do that again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's worthy of its teaching implications. Mm-hmm. And just curious, have you had any opportunity to meet people with myasthenia gravis? You know, not a lot. Uh, here in Mercer County, uh, as far as I can tell, I think I'm the only one in, in my county. There's there's one lady in the county north of me, but no, not locally. I, wow. I haven't I physically met a single person other than myself with myasthenia. Now, I'm a member of several Facebook groups. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that helps. It helps a lot. You know, when you can share and, and know that there are mm-hmm. other people that um, that are out there, but yeah, you're alone. You're, I tell you, you know, you're alone for the first few months with this thing or, or years because you look fine. You, yeah. You'll look fine. And when mm-hmm. you try to explain to people just how bad you're feeling, yeah, you know, they tend to look, but yeah. Yeah. But you look great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hear, hear that. <laughs> um, thanks, Glenn. Uh, okay. Next question is for Ben. From a director's point of view, could you share how you decided you wanted to portray these patients in sharing their stories? And was it different working with patients and other subjects you've worked with before? Yeah, it was. It was It was a very different um, approach from a documentary filmmaking perspective for me specifically because I'm, I'm not someone who has a rare disease. And so with right. any documentary filmmaking endeavor, um, I mean, this is my perspective. I would hope it's most documentary filmmakers' perspective that you want to, first and foremost, be be portraying truth and um, an, an honest perspective that is built around the the people that are in the films. And so, uh, for me, that re- that required a a lot, just a lot of research, mm-hmm. barrier of entry to telling any story that is not um, from your own life experience is is research, uh, but also just just a constant commitment to just listening and hearing um, everything and not trying to map my own experience of life onto the stories. Um, And, you know, these three stories are so different and we spoke to hundreds of people, Mm -hmm. maybe 150, I think Mm -hmm. over the time leading up to this and and heard uh, tons of stories. Mm -hmm. And so the, the perspective with this film in specific to me felt felt like I had really um, just an opportunity to um, to really to step back and to let the stories um, speak for themselves. And, and I hope the films really do feel stepped back and, and don't feel like you can feel the hand of the, of the filmmaker in them. Um, that was the intention. And um, I, I think a lot of that is I think a lot of the the success of the storytelling is, is due to just how great of storytellers Glenn and um, and Teresa and Vanetta are. Like they, I mean, it was just such a such a joy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. As a patient, I was watching them and I got goosebumps because it's like someone is actually saying what you're thinking. So they they were amazing. Um, Glenn. 
Uh, this question is for you. How long was your journey to diagnosis of myasthenia gravis and who in your medical care supported and helped you receive your diagnosis, if anyone? Yeah, I was, I was so lucky. And, and I say that with all earnestness because my path was, was so quick. And I've, I've talked to so many people, uh, especially women that seem to have much greater difficulty in getting some healthcare providers to believe their symptoms. But I was so lucky in that mine took about three and a half, four months before I got a diagnosis. Hmm. Um, and it was, again, it was, it was in May. I had just this rapid emergence of, of symptoms. And um, the, the healthcare provider that really got the ball moving with me was when my double vision emerged, mm -hmm. my ophthalmologist here in town, she, she said, there is something, <laughs> there's something wrong. And she immediately referred me to a neurologist. Now yeah. it was another three months before I could get in to see the neurologist and, and my primary care provider, who was my good friend, he was a doctor that I'd been friends with since I was 18 years old. And the week I went in there to tell him about just how devastating this was and what was going on with me, we hadn't figured it out. He said, I'm moving my practice. So I was, I was, I was left out in the cold. I didn't have anybody to turn to. I didn't. That, you know, yeah. Rick was, Rick was my friend and he was leaving the next week. So, um, but, but again, I'm so thankful, even though it was three months, it was only three months. And I got into, I got into see my neurologist, Dr. Parks. <laughs> I, I hand in the letter and, and I, just like in the video, he, he said, you probably don't have myasthenia, which is what I'd written down. But the antibody test came back you know, really high. And he, he called me at a nine, nine o'clock a week later at night at home. He called me and said, you have myasthenia. Wow. And at, it was I was happy and I was sad because uh -huh. I realized what the implications of that really meant. Right. No, it's hard. I know. Um, a final question for Ben. Due to the circumstances of the film being made during the COVID pandemic, what made the process of creating this documentary unique? Did you apply any techniques in a mystery to me that you hadn't before? Absolutely everything about uh -huh. uh, making the films was different from what we've done in the past. Um, the, I, I don't know if it, if, if we communicated it clearly enough with the title at the beginning of the film, but the films were, I've never met Glenn in person. Mm -hmm. um, we shot the films via Zoom, essentially. Uh, we shipped cameras and sound gear to um, Vanetta, Glenn, and Teresa. Mm -hmm. And we spent a number of days or weeks, actually, um, on Zoom with them, um, more or less instructing them on how to record various components of their life so everything wow. um and a camera guy never showed up so glenn and his uh wife and his family filmed their own life with a laptop in the corner of the room and me chirping out of it uh you know probably barking to like you know tilt the camera to the left or, or <laughs> do something else um which if you if you're not familiar with how normal documentaries are shot. It's not like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it usually requires me and another person and a sound guy sitting in the corner, filming everything like crazy people for mm -hmm. weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end. Um, but yeah, this was, this was very different. And uh, I, I have to say, I mean, the filmmaking experience was a team experience because yeah. as the filmmaker, I was, uh, not present. <laughs> I didn't actually do any filmmaking. Wow. Uh, Glenn shot. Glenn shot his own film himself. He is. He is. Uh, he is due co-director credit. Graduated, yeah. On the on the film, um, but yeah, it, yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Oh, and how was that experience for you, Glenn, as a filmmaker? I, I loved it. I loved every <laughs> bit of that. I, I, you know, it was just it's the geek side of me coming out. Right. And I just I. I Ben and Karen and David and Arturo and I'm, I'm leaving out everybody, but they were just the best people in the world and they treated me with such respect. But it was it was the neatest experience, and uh, I, I was I was so careful not to break anything. And here these guys have got me <laughs> putting this really expensive camera on a windshield on a truck. 
And I was just, oh, I'm going to break this thing. But it was, <laughs> it was so neat the way, you know, and I, I'm a big, strong fireman. And, and, you know, within, within 45 minutes, Ben had me in tears, had me, you know, and I, I, I psyched myself out, but you know, it hits you. It hits you hard when you're recounting your own experience. Right. And it, it is so, such a devastating part of your life. Yeah. And I tell you, emotions just came out and uh, wow. Ben, did, ben did such a great job with that. It was, it was a wonderful experience and such a great product. I mean, yeah, you did like having those moments of crisis that we call them and then having to grab the camera and be like, okay, I'm going to share this. Was that hard? It, it was, it, it was, it was hard l later in the afternoon. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to do better in the morning. And I think everybody yeah. with my senior probably, you know, more probably agrees with that. You know, you, you tend to get it. I remember one day we were shooting and uh, I just, I was toasted. I, I, I was, and, and they could hear that, you know, and they quit, they, they stopped, they stopped them. And I just, I can't do it anymore. And, um, and you, you just tend to give out, but, but it was, it was, it was difficult. I, I, I tried my best to, to give them as much as I could. And, in, in the, I guess the, the little bit of um, information that I could gather about what a storyboard actually was. And um, mm -hmm. I, I did, I did that thing one night in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah. um, when I get up with cramps and you know, you know where, do you know where I got more grief? Um, all my friends, every one of my friends just, they were incredibly supportive. But I got more grief from Facebook groups because I wasn't sick enough. And yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's I, I was surprised because I would think, you know, a lot of the folks in the Facebook groups would be incredibly supportive. A lot of them weren't. So I was I was shocked with that. But everybody here locally, they, they were they were incredibly supportive of what what this endeavor was. So um, it just it was such a wonderful experience to me. No, you did amazing, really. Like coming from an MD patient, I really felt everything you were saying. So thank you for that. Um, I should say, I should say too. Glenn already had a drone when we started, <laughs> yes. when we started filming. The drone was the drone shots were already coming in two oh months gosh. before we started <laughs> filming. Um, and Ben, would you consider doing that again, like giving cameras to other subjects if you do another documentary? <laughs> only if it's Glenn. Only if it's Glenn. <laughs> I would think re it, it was a wonderful experience, but I would think really, mm -hmm. if if, I, if we were in a, if we were in another global pandemic 2.0, <laughs> um, then yes. Okay. But, um, I definitely still to this day, I uh, have not met Glenn, and I'm in person, and I'm dying to. And the process of being present in in making a documentary is like. Is, is so important to me yeah. uh, that it was heartbreaking for me a little bit, like to not get to, to, to be there um, and, and to experience those things. So I guess my answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> it was an experiment. It was a mystery to you too. It was. It was. Um, okay, so final question to Glenn and Ben. What is a positive aspect do you both learn from this experience? Like to Glenn about sharing your story and to Ben about connecting the connection you had with patients, in this case, Glenn, whom you've um, gotten to know about this process. You basically, that, yeah, you've shared a little bit about that, but. You know, I, I, was, I was actually thinking about this the other day. I, so I had a back injury. Um, I was recovering from a herniated disc last summer that happened basically right in the middle of filming this. And that was a um, six month recovery for me. And it was incredibly, incredibly positive and motivating, not motivating is not the right word. It, it, the connection that Glenn and I made making this film really changed my life in a lot of ways. And, and definitely in my experience of that year, because just, I was, I was laid up while I was making this. I mean, I probably couldn't have been making the film if I had been on set because I, I had, a, I had this back injury and mm -hmm. it was ironic um, that the subject of the project I happened to be working on um, that, that I was relating so much to it, but I was, you know, experiencing like a great amount of pain myself in my, in my personal life, just being in a, in a pandemic 
you know, living by myself, um, doing physical therapy every day and making this, um, I, I just found that like just the experiences I had to connect with Glenn and Vanetta and Teresa and step out of my own experience and, um, involve myself in their story. And, um, I mean, it was, it was selfishly, it was, it was an incredibly powerful and transformative experience for me was just the, the connections that, um, that, that, that we formed making it. And, and particularly because it was such a collaborative experience, it, it wasn't a typical documentary experience where I'm just a silent fly on the wall and you film and stay objective and, you know, disappear in, into the distance. Um, it was really quite different than that. Yeah, there needs to be great communication. And for you, Glenn? The, the, the most positive thing that I can say about this whole experience is what it lets me do when I go back in the classroom. Um, it, in public safety and in, in the fire service and in EMS, a lot of times we'll spend 45 minutes to an hour with a patient. And we see a lot of patients, we see a lot. Before this happened to me, and, and I always thought I was a pretty good instructor, mm -hmm. but, but after, this, after this happened to me, I can walk into a classroom and I can, I can share with, with all my firefighters and all my EMS personnel, paramedics, what it means to not be able to communicate, what it means to be 184 pounds and then four months later, 250 pounds because of the medications you have to take. I can, I can tell them about not being able to eat food because food won't go down, not being able to drink anything because water won't go down, about mobility issues, uh, about visual problems. And, and I couldn't do that before. Yeah. I, could read, I could read off a PowerPoint. I could r relate the years I had in the back of an ambulance and on a fire truck, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it with the degree of insight that I have now. And that means a lot when you can share, when you can share something that personal, it's like a pin will drop in a room and they shut up and they listen. And that's important because so many people with a rare disease, so many people with, with, diseases that we can't see just by looking at somebody. If we can share how they feel and how to interact, how to, how to give compassion, how to grieve appropriately, then we've done something. And, and that's, that's the best thing that's happened to me with this whole horrible experience. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. I'm with you there, Glenn. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you both for being a part of today's panel discussion and for sharing your experiences with the community. And thank you again to our friends at ArgenX for sponsoring this event. I would like to invite everybody viewing today to watch the other two short films from A Mystery to Me. The links for each film can be found on this Rare Disease Week platform below. And finally, if you're participating in Points for Advocacy, the Rare Disease Week scavenger hunt, which are a series of challenges throughout the week where you can earn points toward a potential grant for your rare disease organization of choice, the code for participating in the documentary screening and panel discussion is Rare Doc. So Rare D O C. You can navigate to the gamification section of the platform and find the documentary screening and panel discussion challenge. Click the challenge, enter the code, then click submit to earn your points. Thanks again to everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you throughout this year's virtual Rare Disease Week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.